This is the MX Lomas. Owned by Captain Shipping Links player, it is one of the first of a new generation of steamships available in the Grand Isles. Its armament consists of twin carronades and four long guns, with a cargo capacity of 30 and a steam engine. It is part of a fleet of newly constructed oak and iron steamships which have been making their way through trade lands, and it is the focus of today's video. And we want to thank Shipping Lanes Player for allowing his ship to be a part of our battery of tests which helped to make this video possible. And that is our review of the new series class of steamships. The idea of using a series of paddles fixed to a wheel to propel a ship instead of simply relying on the wind or an oar had been a theoretical concept since antiquity. Despite many experimental ships showing the viability of the idea, it wouldn't be until the end of the 18th century when advancements in maritime design and technology and the beginnings of steam technology finally led to the concept becoming a reality. Then in 1807, the first truly successful paddle wheel design would be the North River class of steamboats. Like all newly adapted technology, they were considered unreliable and untested, and as a result these early ships would continue to use their wind-powered masts as a sort of redundancy in case the complex machinery stopped working. A year later in 1808, first ocean-going paddle steamers would be commissioned, and within the next few decades, Spurred by several outspoken advocates for the technologies, we would see warships sporting paddle boxes, even being viewed as important enough to displace the cannons on their broadsides, which had been the most important aspect of a warship's rating for hundreds of years. In 1845, the Rattler and Electo competition would shift maritime interests away from the paddle wheel, but the design would still prove the test of time they would see wartime service all the way until World War II, where they even participated in the Battle of Dunkirk, retaining their important place in history. In fact, paddle steamers have been in continuous service ever since their first commercial introduction. One of the most famous designs is the Clyde River class of steamboats. The Waverly, often considered to be the last ocean-going paddle steamer, is still in operation today. Its iconic design, sporting a wide midsection, indented service doors, dual funnel design, elevated pilot's house, and the twin masts are easy to remember. But the ship's performance in real life is one thing, and the question is, does it hold up its legacy in trade lands? And for that, we have to review its performance in three categories. Our group follows the concept of truth through data, and that means reviewing the performance of ships according to their statistically measurable characteristics and eliminating the human component as much as possible. We rate ships according to their intended purpose. After all, a trade ship should be good at trading, a pirate ship should be good at pirating, and a navy ship should be good at combat. Expecting a ship to perform additional roles is really a secondary consideration, and for that reason we have ranked the ships into three categories. The first is its ability as a privateering ship. A ship's performance characteristics are important here, specifically the ability to intercept ships, maneuver into advantageous positions, and evade those that outclass it. Ever wonder why paddle steamers are rarely shown as pirate vessels? You probably didn't, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It's because in real life, paddle steamers have one very important shortcoming, and that is they can't steer effectively. They are great at going in a straight line, especially in calm waters, but are difficult to turn. Modern paddle boats will use a clutch to overcome this issue, but this is a technology that probably isn't invented yet in the world of trade lands. So it's expected that the maneuverability of the series in trade lands mimics its real life performance characteristics. The coal powered engine gives it a unique privateering advantage due to its ability to go against the wind, but its slow helm response means that even the slowest of trade ships like the goose and the heron, will just maneuver around you. The top three tests that demonstrate this shortcoming were the juke test, point tacking, and TTI, or threat to intercept. The ship receives low ratings on all three of these categories, but this is a trade ship, so we kind of expected that result. The one area where this was able to perform well as a pirate ship was as a mothership with a group of dragons acting as interceptors. In most combinations, dragons are used to prevent ships from fleeing, but because the mother ships used don't typically have steam engines, it means the angle of ambush approaches is limited. 
but the series has a steam engine too, and that means it can open some unique possibilities when used as a mothership. When used in this way, the captain of the attacking group directs one or more of the Dragon Raiders from his crew to a predetermined intercept location that is usually upwind from its trade lane. By using their engines, the entire group will be attacking in a naval pattern known as upwind into the lee of the target. This is the opposite of what most other strategies use when engaging ships, impossible even for some sailing ships to even attempt. Most raiders will be trained to use their dragon's superior maneuverability to direct their prey into a corridor that limits their retreating options, whereas upwind tactics require you to be more aggressive. And to many experienced players, that's actually going to be challenging, especially if you heard me just say that and believe you are already aggressive in your dragon, and I don't know what I'm talking about. And that's because you have to train yourself to do the reverse of what you're used to doing, and that is harder than it sounds sometimes. But when done right, the series can then be used as a hull shield to protect your lighter ships, allowing you to overwhelm the defenses of even the most protected convoys. But before you get too excited, pulling that off against a trained navy, especially one that has gone up against the likes of, say, Hershovian ships, which may have done the same thing, this makes it challenging if you aren't rehearsed for this tactic. Still, most trade ships are looking behind them or to the side for pirates, so this can be an absolute surprise experience to an unsuspecting trader when you're coming upwind at them. But as much fun as this can be to pull off in a series, the truth is the Demeter came out before the series, and so most players who have already figured out this strategy are using it with a Demeter instead. Which, if you had to pick between the two, I'd actually say the Demeter is better than the series for this strategy, and we recommend it for the reasons we're going to discuss in the next section of this video. But to conclude this, as a result, the series is squarely scoring an F as a pirate ship. I really don't think anybody was going to be surprised about that. There is just no circumstance in which this ship seems to be better than any of the options available, especially when compared to the other choices available to you. It's also an expensive gamble to use solely for privateering. The next is the performance as a naval or combat vessel. One of the most famous paddle steamer warships of all time is the Nemesis. Commissioned by the East India Company as a gunboat, it carries four light cannons and two medium cannons. In 1841, the Nemesis took on 15 war junks, the core of the Inyolan, I mean Qing Navy a total of nearly 200 guns in the waters outside of Chuen Pi. In the aftermath of that battle, 11 of the 15 warships were sunk by the Nemesis and the remainder were captured, and all of the forts in the area surrendered as well. Its enemies would then nickname this ship the Devil Ship, a title it would carry for all of its service in Asia. Only paintings and lithographs exist of the ship today, but its armament and configuration is well known and its effectiveness against the real-life Inyolan war fleet is also well known. But what holds up in real life performs far worse in trade lands. Thanks to Shipping Lanes player who donated his ship for this, we were able to take the dimensions and configurations of his specific ship, load it into our battle simulator and see the results, and as expected, it seriously underperforms. In this test, an AI crew will simulate 150 battles, collect the results, and indicate its overall performance against all of these ships. Even when you take the cost of buying this ship out of the equation, the ship still struggles against ships of lesser capability, not even able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against its sister ship, the Demeter, its closest equal. The main problem stems from how the cannons were placed on this ship in-game. On paper, the ship carries a three cannon broadside, but if you apply the firing angles, the problems become clear. Because of the long deck, there is a very small window where the ship's broadside can actually be used to full effect, and it leaves a significant disadvantage in this area. Then there is also the large number of blind spots, accounting for half of all of the approach angles to attack the ship, where it has no ability to respond. As much as it feels like I'm betraying my own traders here, if you're a pirate, we're going to recommend a couple strategies that you should use when engaging this ship. 
The first is always attack from the bow position, not the stern. This is assuming that you aren't specifically targeting the series, but are instead trying to ambush it on its likely trade route. And for the purposes of this, the Demeter and the series have similar profiles and performance characteristics and are both likely to appear on this trade route. But the Demeter will have stern protection, whereas this ship will not. Moreover, when going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a steamship, you always want to attack it from the inside out. This is known as attacking from the lee. The second recommendation is to close the distance on this ship as quickly as possible, especially for low haul point ships. The ship is long, and you can straddle it close enough that the crew can only get one gun to bear on you. If you are at the helm, the ideal distance for you will look about like this. Just zoom your map all the way out and then you can kind of eyeball the distances. But from here, the crew of the series will have a hard time hitting you properly. Then when you are in the correct angle, turn your ship into a boarding position, with the best spot being at the bow as mentioned earlier. And that leads to our third recommendation, and that is to err on overshooting the ship rather than falling short and latching onto the wrong side. If you successfully attacked from the lee and you boarded from the bow, you want to maneuver your ship an additional 45 degrees into the hull of the series if it appears that they are trying to turn around you. Steamships that successfully turn into the wind are likely to break out and evade you, and unless you have a steamship yourself, it's game over for this attempt. To understand why, we have to understand physics. And that is that the velocity of an object requires exponentially more force the further it is from the center of its turning point. To show you an example of how this affects your ship in trade lands, I'm going to use this dock to represent an immovable object. I'm going to speed the video up by five times while I turn this ship 90 degrees, and let's see what happens. As you can see, the moment my ship hit the dock, the ship effectively stopped turning. This is Roblox's torque mechanism at work, because while the ship's turning point should be where the dock hits the stern, this game has been coded so that the pivot points on the ships are in a hidden spot in the center of the model. This is especially a problem for the Demeter in the series because of their length, which is one of the longest in the game. And as a result, leaning your attacking ship into the turning angle of a series, once you know which way the captain is going to turn it, can effectively stop this ship dead in its tracks and prevent it from maneuvering away from you at all, buying you the additional time you need to unload his cargo and bring it over to your ship. Oh, this is assuming, of course, that you chose the peaceful route to pirating. Again, eliminating the human element here, as melee combat is totally unrelated to your ship's performance. But all that said, the reality is that once engaged, this ship is easily outmatched, with its hull points being its only saving grace but its poor maneuverability make disengaging incredibly challenging, and for that reason, its combat performance receives an F rating. The third and most important category for today's video is going to be merchant ships. This is the ability of a ship to pay back the cost of building that ship, turn a profit, and of course, outperform all of the other trade ships in the Grand Isles. The reason for this ship's existence is best summed up by the description in the shipwright. It's the Birkeland's answer to the Pershovian's Demeter. And to this end, it's pretty much an accurate statement. The most important aspects to a merchant ship comes down to three questions. Always these three questions. One, how long will it take to earn the money back that you paid for this ship? Two, how much money can you make above the alternative options available at this level? And three, how easy is it to earn a profit? There are other factors, such as the ability to do crosswind on high population servers, but these are circumstantial. Those three questions, though, are the most important factors in nearly every case when it comes to trading. So let's look at our trade velocity chart and see where the series stacks up. This chart shows all of the ships currently available in trade lands as of making this video and their average trade velocities in doubloons per minute. With the addition of the series, there are now five top tier ships. Effectively, once you get one of these five ships, you are at the end game for trading. On the triangle trade route, here are the performance in doubloons per hour that you can earn in these five ships. 
At level 24, you would expect that this ship is at the top of its class, and while it does slightly beat out the Demeter due to its slightly better docking characteristics, its still overall value is less than a camel. But the main issue with all of these in-game trade ships is of course still the Grouse. While the Grouse costs 301,000 in doubloons and materials, the series costs over 3.1 million in doubloons and materials, with a rate per hour improvement of only about 1,000 doubloons per hour. And that means you would be required to run the series in 300 hours of trading before you will even see a noticeable improvement, and that's after you've already paid this ship off. Unfortunately, if all you're doing is the triangle trade, then the existence of the camel means you will never outperform any of the alternatives. Moreover, the camel has superior defensive capability, making that earlier strategy of attacking the bow a critical strategy in the camel's case, not just a recommended one. But the one area where this ship does perform decent is in docking. In a bit of coincidental irony, the widened midsection of this ship and the elevated platform for the helmsman, which is usually you, by the way, for a solo trader, and the convenient removal of the railings aboard the mid location of the ship means you can get on and off this ship much faster than you could in a Demeter, something which can make this ship more fun to cruise around in, even if you aren't working at the ship's peak performance. And it's with that, unfortunately, we have to rate this ship as an F in trading as well. It's just not profitable. An unfortunate ranking, really. To be honest, we didn't have the opportunity to show you what a good ship looks like. But the fact is that this ship is not profitable when compared to alternatives, it has a high cost, and there are other options that you should take over this one if cargo trading is ultimately your goal. And with that, I will make a closing comment. This ship may have received poor ratings in all categories, but that's because it's an endgame ship. And the reality is, you aren't building this ship to be in one of these three roles, you're building this ship to flex. It's currently the last ship in the line of dedicated merchant ships, and you are building it to show that you have effectively won the end game of trading. And to this end, I've seen a number of series class ships already built, and most of these are ironically being built out of oak and iron. So congrats to all of you who are dedicated enough to trade lands to do that. And for all of you who built the series or plan to in the future, I do look forward to seeing yours in game. But until that time, I'm going to wrap this up and get back to trading. I hope you found this review helpful, and I thank you all for watching.